I've been um, looking forward to this session for quite some time. The reason is I work very closely with these two wonderful people here. So just introducing Troy Cunningham. Troy has been a client of ours for as long as I can remember, many, many years. And I remember years ago, Troy getting involved and modeling even way back um, application security in a sort of more proactive approach, recognizing you can't scan yourself secure. Interesting paradigm. And then along comes Ankit, Ankit Pratik. Ankit's one of our VPs of technical services. Ankit's a um, mind the size of a planet, but also really seriously into DevSecOps and making those sorts of programs work. So Troy, when you and I were talking um, on one of our sessions and we were just sort of putting the world to rights, um, you were telling us about your introduction to madness. But where we went with that is um, we have not seen very often someone really take such a systematic approach to the way in which they manage their risk. We've seen people will use Confluence to model things. We've seen other sorts of GRC types of platforms, but you've done this just beautifully. And I know it's been a compounding project over the years for you. And recently, you know, you uh, you released your um, blog as well, an Instruction to Madness, basically looking at how you systemize security assurance. So I thought we'd spend a few minutes. We'll do this as a three-part series because there's a lot to cover, but just from a higher level, um, to get you and Ankit talking, I'll step back a little bit, moderate for our wonderful audience while I listen to you guys talk the perfection. So Ankit, when you first saw Troy's model, what inspired you about it? Because there's a lot we learned from it, isn't there? Yeah, true. So when Troy first explained like what, what his expectation was, said so it, it was all new to me. Yeah, it was systematic, and I, I, I didn't know what exactly we are going to do over here and how it's going to pan out, what else this might turn into. So like I used to joke about this months later, the thing that, so I was doing risk assessment for six months and I had no idea it's called risk assessment because it just felt like the only logical thing to do. And then that's when I started thinking and I thought that, well, why did we do this before? And I was coming from a different angle. I was coming, always have been working as a third party contractor and, you know, testing, pen testing, when did. So I started putting it into application and how it can work on my side of things as well. Because like you said, in scanning your way into security doesn't work. And slowly and gradually in your career, you realize that because you test an application, you retest it. Then uh, next year, you go and do the same application. You find the same bugs. And then you think like, oh, okay, the team is stupid. Probably they can't fix something. So you're not adding as much value as you should or all third party uh, pen testing companies should then uh, i i i mean troy was my mentor without even knowing it <laughs> so it was very difficult to get in touch with troy like every week but then when finally it did happen and and i and i confessed to him that see this is what you have done and you know now, now everything that i did from the past 10 11 years I did not learn as much as I did working with Troy for, for just six months. And it was easy. I mean, you find tons of books about security, about risk, how to do this and that, but but you pick it up because it sounds good, it's new, but then when it comes to implementation, you just drop it somewhere. It's like, okay, this now it doesn't make sense. So now whatever Troy had created, I, I was like dumbfounded. I was like, okay, well, how, how did this happen? My first question to Roy was that, how many years did it take? And I said, like, nah, two, three, somewhere around that. And, no and it was like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, if, if anybody takes a look at it, they would be like, wow, this is not, this doesn't look like a one person's work. This no. this would require a dozen people and, and so many months just to put it, put everything out there. So systematic, easy for any, anyone to understand, whatever background you're coming from. And if you have done pen testing for, you know, enough years now that could be anything maybe some people have that kind of learning in five years or ten at some point you will realize that well okay this is way better than just doing a yearly audit and this is how you should be doing things i feel we're on a crescendo we're building up to the what is it so this is where grc risk and taking a logical view to application security development Really, yeah. really progresses. Troy, tell us about it. What what drove you to this? What is this thing? 
Yeah. So basically, I mean, trying to like, I'm even trying to distill this into a really short uh, kind of yeah paragraph. My approach to security is to be kind of um, ground based, granular, right? Um, I want to uh, understand the security of an application or the security of a system by ways of understanding its components. I kind of have this fundamental belief. I don't know if this is the right way to put it, but that, you know, applications are more than the sum of its parts or an asset is more than the sum of its parts. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that like I unpick during, you know, either presentations or even throughout this blog that I'm trying to write or the series that I'm trying to write about like how that forms up. But I think the key piece here, um, and I think the part that surprised um, you guys or surprised Ankit was the fact that I'm like, okay, this application, here's some source code. That's a thing, right? Here's um, uh, a pen test. Okay. That's a thing that tells me something. There's some vulnerabilities about it, but also here's how it's built. Right, like that's the thing. Here's the architecture. Here's the data inside of it. Here's what that means to me as a business or owner or whatever, uh, or as a client, right? Um, and overlaying all of that and starting to track and create relationships between that, such that you can make a decision. Like, I don't know. I have a result in a pen test, and it says it's medium, but actually, I don't care about it. Like maybe it's a low to me because the architecture of my application, I understand it enough such that this thing is only really executable through this various thing, like behind the firewall, it's mitigated by some other thing. Um, and actually the data in there that can be accessed through that is not very important. But to come to that position means having a bit of an approach to understanding that. And I think that's the systematic approach. It's a way of saying, okay, well, we have an application, but actually there's all of this information that we really need to know about it um, to in order to make a good make good decisions about the application. And that comes to risk reduction, that comes to automation and scale. And like, how do we know stuff about an application? How do we make sure it's secure that we understand it? Like, uh, yeah, so I... I think that's the smallest I can distill it. There's so much there into like we'll the workflow it. and the process, but yeah. We'll unpack it. Now, this was really interesting. So um, as everyone knows, I wear the CRO hat in the organization and it's very unusual. You have a VP come up to you and you say, hey, we found a way to stop pen testing for this client. You think, okay, interesting. I like it. It sounds good. It's ethical. It's the right thing to do. Tell me why. Where is the value? What's going to happen here? And Anke, I remember you telling me that, you know, in one particular pen test, you would have never found the failure of secrets management buried behind this, but Troy's method did. Why? Where's the flaw in the process? What excited you about it? Because that got me going as well. So Troy briefly touched upon that. I, I was going to interrupt you when I asked you a question saying that, so, you know, like I was saying that how you find tons of books about how to do this, how to do that, success management, threat modeling, architecture and all that, which you pick up and then you drop it midway because, because it's very difficult and you don't have that kind of a skill set. It's not really common. So what Troy finally did, and I don't know what was the motivation behind it, but that we talk a lot about how to reduce friction between the dev teams and the security teams and IT teams. And, and so if you look at Troy's dashboard, initially I thought Troy built that that tool <laughs> so, because I had never worked on that tool before. So it, it was just asking relevant questions from relevant people. So if it's a business level question, okay, it's answered over there. Security level questions, answered over there. Dev related questions, it's there. So it's just asking those questions, everybody trying to understand each other. So, hey, I'm a security guy. This is what I'm supposed to do. I know this. Dev teams, this is what we do. This is the, what standards and compliance and all that we follow. If we don't know about that, let's start a dialogue. Let's say, okay, not trying to get in the way. So this process naturally starts reducing, removing friction, like internally at least. So now when a third party vendor comes in anytime, this is something that this information is always missing. You just say, so, well, the company would say, I just want you to do a pen test because I need a checkbox and that's it. Done. Renew the certificate, 
get all that those things. So there is a scope. You see, so many companies get compromised all the time. You know, don't you think like they don't have internal security team? Like they're not doing a pen test. They are, but th- things are not transparent. I, it never like in all the time that we we chatted and stuff like that. It never occurred to me that the fact that there's a step before that, like you know, in in and some of the previous working experiences that we've had together as well, it was always like that. It was always like, oh yeah, by the time I come to a, a point of pen testing, like I already know a whole bunch of things about the application, right? Like it's not a it's not a black box for me. And the fact that um, that's not always your experience is almost a bit shocking to me. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, it's like, <laughs> of course, you know, you should kind of, what are you spending your money on? If you, if you exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like, without giving you, you have some expectation context. of the results, you know, that's what's missing. So now, now earlier, I was pretty happy with clients who would say, well, we want a white box and a code assisted pen test. Uh, I, I rolled with it. I was like, okay, this looks fun. This is fine. It gives me more context. But then when I f- started thinking about, the whole and when I started looking at your architecture diagrams and all and threat modeling, I said, okay, this looks fun. So why don't we have these questions like come from the client? That I know my application, or this is what I know about my application or an asset. And these are the tests that I want you to perform. So most of the time you won't need a pen test to uh, to you know just understand what's there, what's not. If something is missing, how are you gonna go and test it? It's not there. Right. So yeah. you have you have your threats, you have your risks, and then you have a mitigation. Then you do a pen test to just test those mitigations out. So like you were saying, Troy, so maybe you report something as a medium. We, or most often we would report something as a high or a critical, and then that instantly creates friction and nobody understands it. Because from whatever information yeah. you gave me, I believe it was a critical, but I didn't have that context. I didn't know your application. And then... Sometimes I might report something as a medium or a low, and then you would say, oh, no, this this is critical because this is how important this asset is. This is a multi-billion dollar asset. So this instantly becomes well, critical. The problem space with like pen testing in general, right, is that most people are getting pen tests so that they can have some document or something that's by a third party, Crest certified. Here, we've done the thing. We've done the thing. It's like a ch- it's mm-hmm. a checkbox exercise that produces a few more results than perhaps some other checkbox exercises, right? And they generally are um, they're actionable. They're readily actionable. You know what I mean? You're like mm-hmm. this vulnerability is quite. You know, go look this up in the OAuth handbook. This is how to reduce this. You know, this is how to change this feature, right? Um, and it's so like dominant in the industry. Everybody asks you for one. Um, but hardly ever anybody cares about the context, right? Um, mm. I've had like meetings with some clients about this in the past, right? Where they pen tested, let's say one of my applications or I've hired a pen test and they saw all of these results and and they didn't think about the context, right? They just mm-hmm. saw low, medium, high. I'm like, oh, well, this doesn't matter or this, this, because you can't execute it down that. And the reality is like, none of that mattered to them. Um, because it was like, oh, but but that's context that requires a deeper understanding. And because I think the market, the industry doesn't seek penetration testing for the sake of testing, like for actually understanding, like what's the mm-hmm. actual, you know, how do I'm actually going to get in this? They like, it's almost like penetration testing is no longer red teaming in a sense. Now we that's interesting. That a different thing. Troy, I mean, except I'm, I'm... that this has always been what it was before. It was like, let's try to break into this thing, find out the vulnerabilities, so that we understand how safe it actually is. That's, yes, but what you've done what, intentionally. What whole. you've done though is you've lifted the context of this, which is really interesting. So, understanding, as you say, the system, and you know, having the resources. You know, that's also another one you see teams with, you know, GRC, you know, team, blah, 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 blah. But it's quite rare, not 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 fundamentally rare, but quite rare that people do proper threat models. Ask the application owners, how did you implement encryption? How did you implement secrets management? That's the that's things- the thing that hold on the hold on to that thought. That's that's the thing. So never have I uh, had this kind of an experience where there's a open dialogue happening between me and the product owners and the dev teams and the mm-hmm. IT security teams. Most of us, most of us spent testers don't even know because this option exists. It's okay to ask these questions. It's okay to get more context. So when you're trying to, otherwise you're just trying to prove yourself. 
Like I was given an application. If I don't have multiple red and yellows, then I'm stupid, right? And then you start doing it. And like I was saying, so something, so it can happen both ways. Maybe you report something with a lesser severity and then it's deemed as, as like more severe internally. Either way, or if it's a high severity and it goes to low severity, that trust is gone instantly. Why? Because a developer is, or, or the team who's responsible to find a fix for, after you have shared a pen testing report, they're supposed to find solutions. So when they're establishing context, and if they find even one of those things which says, okay, this doesn't add up, instantly your report will be like thrown away. I'm like, this person doesn't even know a thing about my application. If they've made one or two mistakes, I'm not even going to take any, any of their suggestions because it's just null and void. It doesn't matter to me. It's just thrown out. Don't care. Don't bother. I don't need to fix anything over there. I'm not saying that pen testing is like irrelevant. No, it it's still really good to unravel a lot of things. But what we realized that when, let's say, working with Troy, we, we were given an asset, an application, and it was just that, so let's do a pen test of this. But then we started having these calls and we understood that in order to do a complete security assessment of this particular application, I think we need to include a few more things in scope. That was missing right. because like I was saying, like a lot of companies, they do pen tests, they still get compromised and they feel like, oh, secrets were everywhere, in Slack and in Confluence and everywhere there were secrets. Why weren't these things unravel in, uh, in a pen test? Well, you know, Social engineering was not allowed in a pen test. We never managed to get inside your Slack or Confluence. We never saw the secrets. We had no idea about your standards and policies in the company. If we had those information, well, we would have just given you a suggestion. Well, maybe start doing that. Why are you sharing secrets and plain text? Why is it in your AD? Why is it? Why are you putting that on Slack? If somebody compromises your Slack admin or something, then they can think and see all that. We, we have heard lots of stories like recently that these things are happening. But why is it happening? Because you're not being transparent, not even with your internal teams and then external teams, forget about it. And nobody is this transparent. But even I didn't know, like in my 11 years of career, I didn't know, okay, this is a possibility. Like why is a third party company just going in there trying to prove themselves instead? Why can't we just talk to their people and you know be a part of their team? get more context and add value. Stop trying to prove yourself. And in this journey, you learn a lot like I did. I mean, I can go on and on about the things that I have learned. But <laughs> I mean, I will have to do like five series podcasts for that. <laughs> just, yeah. And that will be just me talking for 30 minutes you know, nonstop. So yeah, it's it's that huge. It's it's It has so many things. And and this is a right. skill set that, yeah, yeah, don't worry. I, was gonna, I think the problem, though, that you mentioned it really early on is because it's hard. Like, let's be really honest about security, right? Like, like, super, super dead honest. Is it, it's not a trivial thing to look at a system, break it down into the components which build up that system, um, break those components down to things that might be vulnerable, model and map them in the same way you would model and map a city. Um, they're complex systems right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's several, several different layers, right? Uh, you know, people think of an application, they think about the UI, they think about the UI on their phone. How many people really think about like, what's the memory space that's being taken up? Right? Like, nobody thinks about buffer overflows anymore. But it's a thing. It's a physical thing that can happen, right? You get to a certain fill of memory space, okay, well, we need to change it into new memory space. People don't physically think about that. They don't think about all of the layers in between. Right, um, because it's complicated, and mm -hmm. I think that's that's the hard thing. Like it, which means you take it needs specialists to get into that. Which means actually you need kind of a specialist approach in order to really um, deal with that. And at this point in security, um, in the like the ecosystem, there are tons of middle specializations or special like. You know, there's people who just do vulnerability management. There's people who just mm -hmm. do AV endpoints. There's people who just do scenes. There's people who just do like incident management. There's people who just do forensics, right? Like there's lots of deep areas to connect into. Um, there's people who just do architecture, whatever. But the reality is to get to a good system, you have to actually tie all of this together. And this is where security is not quite at the same level as airlines or cars or whatever, 
right? You don't, we don't yet, I think, I or I feel like maybe, maybe I'm wrong about this, but my gut instincts is like, we're not yet at the level where we are doing holistic life cycle analysis about the security of stuff in the cyber world, in the virtual world, in the same way that we do it in the physical world, right? Where you understand and consider multiple different contingencies based on, you know, the risks and the threats and the vulnerabilities of that particular thing, like an airplane Mm -hmm. and the likelihood of X, Y, Z happening. Like we don't think about that life cycle way as maturely in cybersecurity. And it's difficult because it takes all those skills and those specializations um so on that on one hand like i also don't blame the industry you know well on that note and then we we need to wrap up and you know we'll we'll, we'll carry on into the the next level of detail but your analogy as you know i'm heavily involved in airline kind of stuff as well and um the reason so many of these aircraft are so safe is because of the compound learning in these complex systems that have gone on because there's not that many vendors and they all work on whole systems and the supply chain, and they get better and better and better at it. Whereas in security, everyone's out on their own. They've all got developers. They're all independent. Oh, yeah. And a lesson learned in one developer is never shared necessarily other than community or education with anyone else. And so it's this, the industry moves slowly and glacially, relatively speaking to, to an airline. Of course, airline evolution is actually relatively slow as well. Yeah, so another big challenge that this solved, like which Troy's model solved, was was uh, again how we call it as a using risk as a tool. So it becomes very easy to explain it to to the business people, which which is often you know, a problem for us. Uh, you, you know, you're doing pen tests, or you are working as an extension of some some of your clients team, and then there's some business person who just comes in and says, "Okay, so what is the meaning of this? What is the value of this?" Because you have not mapped anything. You don't even know how valuable a particular asset is for you. What could go wrong? Once you have all those things answered, then whatever you do downstream, it it starts adding up. It, you can connect the dots and you can understand, yeah, okay, this now com- makes sense to me completely. Even to a non-security person, if you're just dealing with finance and business, I'm like, oh, okay, this, this makes sense. Now I know why we need these pen tests. And even a non-security person can look at this process and see that, okay, this is teeny tiny in the last bit exercise that we do, which we call a pen test, then it starts adding so much value right from the bottom to the top. This context, it's all about establishing the actual context of the thing, and that's understanding it deeply. That is driving standards. Guys, really interesting. I look forward to our next session. I can't wait to record that with you and I hope our uh, audience out there finds this useful as well. Troy, Ankit, thank you as always.